morning, everybody, and welcome to our first Meet the Authors session for Regulatory Intelligence. Um, I'm very excited to announce the release of the third edition. Um, it's been a long time coming. Um, the third edition has been substantially updated. Um, every chapter has been expanded, revised, and updated, and we have um, six new chapters in the book. The book is 200 pages. It's comprised of 25 chapters, 30 different authors from seven different countries. It's available in print and ebook format. Um, Danielle is going to pop in the link of where you can purchase the book. Um, it's $125 for members, $175 for, for non-members. So this, this new book took a totally different approach from the first and second edition. The first and second editions of Regulatory Intelligence was developed by one single author. Um, when um, that author had to, to drop out because of um, over, over committed professional obligations, um, we went out to the editorial advisory committee to find um, someone to take over the project. Uh, Bill Sitzma volunteered from the editorial advisory committee and as he reviewed the past edition, um, he thought it would be um, a, a good direction to go to create a book with multiple authors and mul multiple auth chapter authors and multiple reviewers. So the whole structure of the, the, how we did the book changed. Um, Bill and uh, Danish Ashraf are the lead editors on the book and they sit on this panel this morning, as well as Celine Rodier, who is a chapter author on regulatory intelligence. Um, I would like each of them to uh, give a brief, brief description of their involvement and then we can go ahead and talk about um, the book and the update and open it up for questions. And Danielle, if you could go ahead and launch that um, poll question on the level of experience, please. Absolutely. Bill, do you wanna go ahead and, and start out? Uh, sure. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. And uh, my involvement was as one of the editors of the book. Uh, and we uh, worked very hard to find uh, expertise around the globe to contribute to the book. Danish. Hello, everyone. My name is uh, Danish Ashraf. Um, like Gloria said, I was one of the co-editors of the book, uh, working with Bill on this. Uh, one of the first um, projects like this I worked on, it was a great experience for me, and I did uh, really did enjoy it. And, and, and I hope uh, everyone is able to enjoy the book, too. Celine? Hello, good morning, good afternoon. So I am Celine Rodier. Uh, I am senior health manager Health Policy Manager at Clarivaid. I have 15 years of experience in regulatory intelligence, and uh, I'm really glad that uh, I've had the, the chance to contribute to this uh, project with uh, Danish and Bill. And I've written the chapter on how to, uh, uh, to, to set up a regulatory intelligence department, and uh, I'm sure we will talk about that later. While we're on, on, on you, Celine, why don't you tell us um, how you got involved in the project um, as, as a, a chapter writer, whether you've written for reps before, and then how you see your chapter, it was right, how to set up an RI department, how you think that fits into the overall um, story of reg regulatory intelligence, the, the importance of the chapter, and then how you feel like it fits into the bigger, the bigger how it fits into the bigger puzzle. Okay, so I've been given this opportunity, in fact, to contribute to the book, uh, thanks to my colleague, uh, Larry Liberty from CIRS. Uh, he's also at the board of RAPS now. Um, and uh, Larry was aware of my experience in regulatory intelligence and uh, the fact that I am passionate about this topic. And he knew that I was also involved in other initiatives um, around uh, developing awareness and capabilities of regulatory regulatory intelligence professionals. And uh, for sure, I didn't hesitate a second to seize this opportunity to contribute. And um, for in relation with your question for uh, the chapter five, um, I think that, um, well, I, I've tried to write it in um, basing myself on my own experience. 
as a regulatory professional as well as a regulatory intelligence uh, consultant. And um, also I have been able to collect feedback from professionals in small and bigger organizations over years uh, through my work and through uh, my volunteering at uh, Topra. And in this chapter, uh, I have observed that uh, in fact, no matter the size of your organization, there are certain steps uh, to take to set up efficiently a high department. And this starts with mapping your stakeholders, what are your customers' needs. And you need to know them, uh, know their goals, uh, need to understand how they work so you can best support them uh, with your regulatory intelligence uh, activities. Uh, because I am convinced that uh, regulatory intelligence is not about sharing information, but really making sure that the information uh, you, you identify is then, is then um, actionable to your stakeholders. And um, also, in fact, there is another important point in this chapter. Um, that is to say that regardless of your company size, in fact, organizing a, a regulatory intelligence department, it is possible, uh, even on a, on a limited budget, in fact. And this really starts with having someone willing to, uh, uh, to contribute and with good research skills, good communication skills. So you don't necessarily have to invest massively when you start such a RI department. And uh, really lastly, um, and, and based on my interactions with the uh, regulatory intelligence professionals, and especially young professionals, um, their feedback is the fact that they are under-equipped to start such activity in their organizations. And uh, their frequent questions are uh, around how to, um, to recommend the creation of such departments and how to demonstrate the value of uh, regulatory intelligence to their management. And this is what I've tried to, to cover in this chapter. Thank you. Um, Bill, why don't you talk a little bit about um, why we decided to update the book? Uh, what was, what are the, what are the critically important changes in the book um, and how, how you went about making those decisions at the beginning of the project? Uh, sure, thanks, Gloria. Um, yes, I think we, we wanted to update the book because um, there had been some evolution of the environment since the previous edition. Uh, you know, even with COVID, there's been uh, evolution of the environment. Uh, and uh, another element was that we wanted to globalize the book more. The previous edition was focused to some extent on the United States and we wanted to make it uh, include concepts from Europe, Australia, you know, Asia and other regions. So, uh, so that was why we, we updated it. Um, and uh, we, we did indeed globalize it more. We searched for potential authors, chapter authors outside of the United States. Uh, we also looked for the best talent that we could find to help with the book. And uh, Celine is a great example of that. We appreciate her contribution. Um, and, uh, and it was an iterative process. You know, identifying potential authors is always a challenge. Uh, Gloria sent out notices to the RAPS membership, and that helps, but we also uh, tapped into people that we know, people in our network, and uh, asked them if they'd be willing to contribute. Uh, and, and we also used uh, Linda Bowen as a resource. She you know, is sort of the queen of regulatory intelligence and uh, was able to pull together uh, potential authors as well. Uh, and then from, from there on, it becomes sort of mechanical uh, where we stay in touch with authors, uh, ask them about their progress. Uh, once they get uh, outlines they can send to us, we review those and provide feedback. Um, we also do the same with whole chapters uh, with uh, Donish doing about half the chapters and, and me doing about half the chapters. Uh, then the chapters go to Gloria for her review. And, uh, you know, in the end, we end up with a nice product uh, such as this book. 
Right. Um, just so for everyone um, on, on the meetings edification. So um, the book development process is a pretty efficient process. I oversee that um, with the editorial advisory committee. Um, we have a lot of volunteer opportunities as chapter writers and reviewers on RAPS books. Um, so if, if you want to get involved, you can send me an email. I'll drop it in, in the chat. You can send me an email and we can talk about the process and the steps and the time commitment it, 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 um, that's involved with helping with books. Um, so Danish, you were fairly new to the RAPS book development process and you were recruited by one of the editorial advisory committee members. Um, and we appreciate that to co-lead this effort with Bill. And you really took on the role of um, structure and flow of the book um, and what chapters should come early in the book, how they relate it to each other, what should come at the end of whether we're gonna look forward. Can you talk us uh, through a little bit of how you made those decisions and what was important to you, how the chapters built upon one another, how, how that was important and how it really, we ended up with a really um, better product. And that could be really useful for those new to regulatory intelligence or those seasoned in regulatory intelligence. Yeah, definitely. So when we started the process, we looked at what existed in the second edition. And the second edition was very well done, but like Bill said, it was very US specific. So we went through and saw what the gaps were. And then once we figured out what additional chapters we wanted to add, we looked at the entire chapter list and, saw, and tried to figure out what would be the best way to tell the story that we wanted to tell. Um, so we started off primarily talking about the basics of RI um, and then then I went into the various sources of RI. And this is probably the most comprehensive part of the book because for RI professionals, one of the toughest things to understand when you first get into the profession, and even when you are in the profession for a while, is what are the best sources of information for you to look at? Um, so a good portion of the book is dedicated to um, the best types of sources uh, and locations of sources, both paid and um, uh, free and publicly available. And then after that, we went into more of the chapters that were dedicated to the, def the variety of different deliverables that our uh, RI professionals are responsible for. Um, and then following that, we do actually have a couple of chapters in reg regulatory policy, because we saw that um, regulatory policy work is becoming more common among RI professionals. So we did want to provide information uh, on, on that. And then we uh, kind of ended uh, with the future facing chapter on AI in RI. In, the, in the, the use of AI in, in regulatory intelligence. Um, I personally believe that in five to 10 years, a lot of what we'll be doing in regulatory intelligence and other parts of the pharmaceutical industry will be aided with AI. And I think uh, this chapter that we have near the end is a great introduction to that. And, and we wanted to end the book in a, in a future facing way. And I think that that, that chapter does, does a very good job of that. Okay. Um, Danielle, can you go ahead and launch that second poll question on how people will be using the book? Um, I did have a question that came through the chat. Um, it says, I have not read the book, but could you please advise if there is a chapter that provides information and advice on how to make at least part of the RI tasks in a company billable? Main challenge for me in a big organization is to justify non-billable activities of regulatory experts collecting and analyzing regulatory data to support the RI. Anybody want to address that, Bill? Yeah, this is Bill. Maybe I'll, uh, I'll jump in because I used to work in the CRO industry um, as, as head of uh, regulatory strategy and development. Uh, so I have a an acute understanding of the need for billable activities. Um, you know, in my mind, uh, making them billable is about selling it as a service and uh, assuming that, that you're part of a, of a CRO, um, you could possibly work with your marketing folks to position it as a service uh, and, and sell it as a service. And I, I think there's actually a pretty good uh, market out there for that. There are lots of small companies who would like to be able to collect and use regulatory intelligence, but they don't have the resources to do that. And if you're able to 
build that as a capability and sell it, it could be a profitable enterprise. Okay, thank you. Um, Dennis, do you wanna talk a little bit about, so um, as I stated previously, every chapter was substantially rewritten and updated or we added new chapters. Do you wanna talk about um, some of those chapters that were substantially updated and, and, and what went into those? Sure, yeah, I mean, so when we looked at the chapters that we wanted to update, we first focused on chapters that were very US specific. An example would be uh, Freedom Information Act. We have, uh, the second edition had a chapter on freedom of information. So when we were updating it for the third edition, we went and added information, updating the US information first, but then also finding authors that had experienced globally on that topic. Um, so you see that with um, the, um, the, the, the white paper chapter, I believe, and the guidance chapter, I believe, um, and then, like I said, the, the freedom of information chapter. So making it more global and bringing in more global authors. Um, that was one of the biggest focuses on updating, updating the book. Okay. Um, so, and this can be to the whole panel and, and anyone can answer this. What would you tell participants on why they need need this book, especially if they already own the second edition, what would be the selling factor on why this is something they need on their bookshelves? Yeah, I'll start. Uh, I think it's a great resource because it has a lot of information about where to find particular types of intelligence. So if for no other reason, uh, it's the kind of book that you'd want to remember and pull off your shelf when you're wondering where to look for something. Yeah, and then to Bill's point, I mean, so, so that type of regulatory research work isn't just done by regulatory intelligence professionals. Uh, most people who work in regulatory have to know where to find information like that. So it, it is useful for a variety of different professionals. But uh, I guess to, to your question, if you have the second edition, why would you buy the third? Um, that specific, uh, the, the specific sections on resources were greatly enhanced, not only by making them more globe, uh, offering more global resources, but also um, updating the, the resources that it did exist because um, the resources for regulatory intelligence do evolve over time and they have evolved since the, the previous edition. Yeah, and I can't speak for the second edition of the book, but uh, for sure the great value of this book is the fact that it centralizes lots and lots of information around regulatory intelligence. And uh, it's up to date because we know we are living in a world that is changing all the time. And how you have the latest uh, thoughts, the latest experiences from the authors uh, on, on this topic. So I think this is what makes the difference of the book. Um, tell the audience a little bit about um, the databases available because the book talks a lot about um, there are actual free resources out there that people can tap into and then there are commercial resources that people can pay for um, and anyone can answer this. Can you talk a little bit about um, the value of paid versus free and, and what someone in the RI role would, would, would need on a day-to-day -day basis and how they would make that decision. I can give us- <laughs> well, I mean, when compared, go, go ahead, Sally. No, no, I, and I don't want to promote any database, but uh, probably you know that uh, I've been working for the Cartelist Regulatory Intelligence Database. Um, so of course I will say that uh, these paying databases are useful resources. Now, I appreciate that not all companies can afford uh, such subscription-based databases. Um, so you need just to balance and again, identify your needs, why you are uh, gathering information, why you are monitoring it and what's the outcome of it. And um, if you can already start with free, freely available sources, know them well, uh, target your information and um, Maybe at some point we, you will be challenged by the languages, you will be challenged, challenged by um, 
all the, uh, the publications with uh, the, the volume of data to analyze, and maybe that would be the time to, to question yourself on maybe moving on to, uh, to a paying uh, database. Yeah. Sure. Um, and, and, and... Oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Bill. Well, I was going to say a, a shout out to Susan Lawfer, who wrote that chapter, uh, chapter 11 in the book. Uh, she's in the audience. Thanks, Susan. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then, to, yeah. So the um, like, like um, something was saying, the the paid resources, um, like Cortellus, are great to use because they're they were able to compile a lot of different pieces of information uh, into one location, and it's easy to to go through it. But they, like Salim said, are, tend to be very expensive, and if um, the company has a, a less of a budget for RI, it can be difficult to acquire them. Um, but I mean, the book does cover uh, a variety of different public um, resources that I was looking. We have uh, a chapter on public uh, resources that, that's almost 20 pages. Um, so we, we list a good number of these public resources that are free to use that will provide a lot of the same information that is in the paid um, resources, but they do you know, require a bit more work and, and um, uh, flexibility to use. Um, so we, the, the book offers a variety of different options for, for all different types of budget. Okay, thank you. I have a question from the audience for Celine or, or, the, or Bill or Danish. Um, could you talk a little bit more about how to convince management that regulatory intelligence is a worthwhile investment? The cost of non-compliance is huge. So this is the first thing to, to say to your management. If you don't invest in regulatory intelligence, you won't be compliant. You won't have robust regulatory strategies. And this will have a huge cost to your organization. And then you can also talk about the direct cost. But uh, these two elements are really key. Anybody else? And then I think the, the other great part of having an in-house RI group is that they're great for emergencies. Um, so currently I'm, I'm the regulatory intelligence lead at Biogen and there's been a variety of situations that the company has been in where there's a, a, um, a dire need for information very quickly. And if uh, my function did not exist, uh, that type of work would be very difficult to do um, quickly because uh, if a group does not have an in-house RI group, uh, that type of work is being done on the side um, by other folks in regulatory. Um, so to have someone or, or a number of people dedicated to that work um, greatly pays off in uh, when, when there's a dire need of information quickly. And I think the COVID crisis has really shown the importance of uh, uh, the regulatory people and more especially regulatory intelligence people in, uh, in pharmaceutical companies. Yes. And, and maybe to add that um, once as a company, you've been blindsided by uh, not having the right information. It's a, it may be a painful lesson to learn, but uh, it reinforces the importance of having access to regulatory intelligence. Um, if I can encourage the audience to submit some questions through the Q&A for the panel. I have another question. When we talk about RI, as Celine said at the beginning, we refer to actionable information. What would you say is more important for one organization to have RI coming from regulatory documents, regulations, guidelines, law, or internal operation knowledge-based RI? I would not say one is more important than the other. Um, one which is really important is uh, on the ground intelligence. Uh, if you are working with different markets, get also information from people in the countries uh, with uh, local experience, rather than just relying on the published guidelines. Uh, because sometimes you may have quite huge discrepancies between these guidelines and what is actually required by the authorities. Okay. And just drawing from my own experience um, at Caladrius, I often learn many new things by going back to historical interactions with FDA, um, things that I had forgotten that had occurred four or five years ago, but when I go back and review them, I find information that's even relevant today. So I, I can attest that the internal 
resources are very important as well. Yeah, I think it's important to, to look at both, depending on the question, but uh, it, it is always surprising to see, like, like Will said, how much uh, the problems that you are facing today, you also faced, uh, you know, years or, or, or uh, weeks prior or months prior. Okay. Um, so we have six new chapters in the book. And what I've been hearing a lot about um, is artificial intelligence. And we actually have a chapter on artificial intelligence current emerging role of artificial intelligence in RI. Um, do one of you want to talk a little bit about that chapter and how it came to be in the book and the importance of artificial intelligence in RI? Um, I, I, can, I can speak on that. I was the editor for that, for that chapter. Um, so the chapter was written by um, uh, Oliver um, Stack from Deloitte. Uh, and his colleagues from Deloitte. And um, if, you, uh, if you've seen him speak, I think he's sp spoken at a variety of different conferences at RAFs and, and other conferences on the topic of, of AI and regulatory intelligence. And um, I, had, I had asked him to, to come in and, and, and write a chapter on this topic because I, uh, you know, hearing him speak and just seeing the uh, amount of uh, attention given to AI and, and the progression of AI, um, I, I thought it'd be very good to include in, in a book like this. Um, but the chapter is a great introduction to what the concept of AI is, what things like machine learning mean, things like that, and how they could be applied to um, regulatory intelligence in, in the future. Um, currently, there's, you know, it's still in its infancy, the use of AI in, uh, in regulatory intelligence, but it's a great primer on things to come. Um, okay. Because uh, as, as, as time goes on and AI is being used for more and more things, eventually you will see it also being used for AI and it's, RI, and it's important to know that uh, up front. Okay. If I can add to it, um, and again, uh, relating to other discussions I've had with other professionals, I think that uh, regulatory intelligence professionals shouldn't be afraid of artificial intelligence. Um, these technologies won't take their job, at least not too soon. Uh, it would, it's more of a support. Um, and uh, because we are talking of an area where there is lots of subjectivity and um, the need to connect multiple sources of information or multiple experience to make your, your own judgment and your own impact analysis, for example. So uh, for sure, don't be afraid, I think. And resume yeah. the technology. Yeah, yeah I, I would agree with Celine on that. I, I, think, I think AI will just be another tool mm. in, in the tool set for AI professionals. It won't be uh, supplanting their, their, uh, their function. Okay. All right, I have some other questions from the participants. Does the book cover intelligence related to CMC or quality part of the dossier or other aspects? GXP inspections. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll jump in. Y yes, uh, it does. Um, some of that information is in the chapter on precedence, which is, oh, I forget which chapter is precedence, uh, but there's also some in the uh, chapter on uh, inspection tracking and inspector profiles, which is chapter 17. Okay, and another one, yeah. how can we connect the actionable items starting from regulatory and extending to QA manufacturing and then coming back to regulatory so to ensure compliance? I would say by having your own internal database where you will um, collect all your um, your cases, your, your, your searches, your, your questioning, you have internally and externally. And so you can still refer back to it and build on experience. Because uh, regulatory intelligence is not only about monitoring external sources, but it's also about you know, building on your own uh, experience with your products, with your manufacturing, with your R&D people and, and marketing, for example. Okay. Uh, if I might remind participants to please put their questions in the q and I'm going to read the last one from the chat and then move over there. 
As Regentel is a service provided to the company, please share your thoughts on customer stakeholder satisfaction. Do you suggest to get feedback per request assessment or more of an overall monthly quarterly feedback? Yeah, Isabel, I, 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 mean, I, I, think, I, sorry. I, I think feedback is always ahead, important and uh, you know, the faster the feedback, the better. So I, if I were in that position, I'd rather get feedback sooner rather than wait for a monthly summary. Agreed. Yeah. 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 I think you should get feedback for each re request you complete. Um, I think it's also useful to do a, a more wider general survey. Um, maybe not quarterly. I think that's a bit too much. Maybe annually. Um, uh, just to see how, how the work um, your group is doing uh, is is um, fitting the needs of the the organization. Yeah. And 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 putting this in relation with <clears throat> sorry the the chapter uh, five on how to set up a high department where you map the needs of your stakeholders um the advice is to go back to this mapping on a regular basis for example on a yearly basis and check whether what you have provided to your internal clients is it aligned with their expectations and indeed you can have this annual survey uh to to your to your with your, to your colleagues uh, but for sure to have, uh, like, uh, like uh, with Uber apps, <laughs> uh, uh, a feedback uh, right after you have completed a request uh, to them uh, is a great tool to, 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 uh, to, to have an understanding of their satisfaction. Um, another question, can you talk on public domain sources for emerging markets like China, Brazil, et cetera? That can be difficult. Uh, you know, if you're a large company and you have someone who speaks the, the language, um, that can be a good way to approach it. Um, but as primarily an English speaker, I also make a lot of use of uh, web translation features like Google uh, Translate. You can have it translate an entire website. So you can go to one of the Chinese language or Portuguese language um, websites which may have this information, and it'll, it'll give you a translation. It's not perfect, but uh, it it gets you most of the way there. Okay. I would add. Um, so for sure, you have the the regulators' websites. You also have trade associations who publish on the topic. Um, liaise with your affiliates, or maybe with CROs as well, or uh, local consultants. Uh, but in terms of uh, public domain sources, you also have, we don't always think about that, but uh, think about scientific literature. Uh, there are lots of articles around uh, regulatory, regulatory intelligence, regulatory science, or um, products that regulators are doing in their, in their countries uh, to, um, to develop their, their frameworks. So, uh, and they are most of the time now open source. Yeah. And, uh... Beyond beyond the, the public sources, I mean, sometimes you you have to rely if you don't have someone local on paid resources like um, Cortella Centaurus, um, mm -hmm. because they they often have the translations um, that they've done themselves. Yeah, and they, they work with local uh, experts on the ground who can uh, again get information which is not necessarily published in the guidelines or by the, the regulators. And they color uh, what again what is written in the guidelines from their experience. So, uh. okay. Another question: What would be the key skills and competencies best suited for regulatory intelligence? AI could be one area where RI professionals need to develop their skills. Would there be any other from your points of view? Curiosity and collaboration skills, number one. <laughs> and we actually do have a chapter on skill sets needed in this book. And I think that's a new chapter, so. Yeah, um, yeah, I, I think um, communication is also very important um, because it's one thing to find the answer to the question being asked. It's another thing to be able to communicate it um, to, to the person in the way that they, they need. They need. Okay. Yeah, by the way, the, uh, the skill set chapter was um, 
chapter four by Kirsten Messmer. It, yes. it, I think it was a great chapter. Um, and, and you know, the uh, this is a continuously an evolving field, and um, there's a lot that that's emerging as far as internet sources of information. And I expect that the audience with their creativity will find even new methods of collecting regulatory intelligence that, uh, that didn't exist last year. So tell us what you find. And if I could um, remind participants that if you go on our RAP's website under publications and resources books, you can actually look at the table of contents on the new book and also get a sample chapter. Um, so you could see all the chapters and who they were written by. So that's, that's nice. Um, for a beginning RI program, what budgetary advice can be provided such as books, subscriptions, personnel, et cetera? A million dollars would be good to start. Is that this is really in your, your chapter covers this? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, yeah, invest it. You, you need to identify your toolbox, read the toolbox <laughs> chapter. Uh, I can't remember which number it is. And um, yes, again, map your stakeholders, map uh, the available tools to you. Um, I understand your budget, <laughs> what budget you have to start, um, because it will make a huge difference if you have zero dollar <laughs> or if you have more. Um, and, um, and identify the subject matter experts as well internally, um, because they will be able to help you uh, in, your, in your work, either the, uh, if you're working on different, with different uh, therapeutic areas um, within your, your organization, so no, uh, talk to these people uh, so that it, they can also scale up uh, your knowledge. Um, yes, again, be curious, talk to a lot of people, <laughs> I would say. Yeah. Another question. And, and what other budgets you got? Okay. I, I was just saying that if, if you're not able to get headcount, um, you can also rely on external vendors if you do have the budget. Mm. Um, because sometimes getting headcount for a, per, a permanent position for regulatory intelligence can be diff difficult. And, and that's a good point because sometimes uh, we could think that um, it will be at cost, of course, to, uh, to contract with external vendors and you won't have the budget. But if you compare to uh, what it will cost you to do it internally or not to do it, it will be more costly, in fact. Okay, another question from participants. In addition to data resources, does the book contain advice on how to refine RI activities to identify information most closely related to your topic of interest? Yeah. We, we do have several chapters that outline the process of doing research and some you know, best practices and tips. So yeah, that, that is covered. It's not just a list of the variety of different resources. We do have chapters on how best to use them uh, to answer the questions that you have. And uh, as well as some tips around uh, knowledge management, again, in chapter five. Uh, okay. They're again, it's important and related with this internal database you need to build. Um, another question, technology is playing a big role in new approvals in the regulatory process. For example, mRNA medicine like COVID-19 vaccine will have a huge impact on how we view regulatory affairs and regulatory intelligence. How is technology approached differently in this version versus version two? You know, te technology has certainly advanced substantially since the last uh, version of the book. And I, I would say that this third edition embraces technology to a much greater extent and it incorporates and talks about how the technology is used. So that, that's, a, I think, a key difference versus, versus the second edition. Okay. Anything else? Is there a difference I, between... I, I, I oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Danish. 
I was just gonna say, I, I think I think they'll cover it. And I mean, the different technologies within um, the uh, drug therapeutics is always going to advance, uh, and and staying up to date on it is is important. And I think the book does does provide resources to do that to do just that. Another question is, is there a difference between RI for pharma versus medical devices? How is this handled in the book? You know, I think the main difference is where you look for the information. And uh, we do incorporate uh, quite a bit of information about devices uh, from chapter to chapter. That was one of the things we tried to include while expanding the book. Not only did we want to make it more global, but we wanted to make it applicable across uh, you know, the various regulatory subsections, including devices. So you'll see, uh, for example, in the, um, the, the chapter that lists all the various sources of information, you'll see in there that there are uh, web links related to device information. Okay. Say that apart from the, the sources and the understanding of the topic, uh, there is no difference whether you are talking uh, about regulatory intelligence for pharma, medical devices, human medicines, veterinary, or even cosmetics. Basically, you will apply always the same steps, the same approach. Uh, maybe the stakeholders won't be the same, uh, but the idea is to be able to monitor efficiently, again, to map your stakeholders, understand their need, and translate uh, the information into something actionable. So. Once you have integrated this methodology, uh, you can apply it to different fields. Okay, I'll move on to another question. As Regentail is a service to the company, please share your thoughts on customer satisfaction. Do you, do you suggest to get feedback? Oh, I think we already answered this one. I apologize. I think we already got one. So here we go. Can you offer any examples, advice, or cautions relating to building up and accelerating a company RI program? Perhaps any traps, distractions, or red herrings that you can share from your experiences? I would advise to start small, <laughs> make baby steps, see what, what is working well, and uh, build on that. Yeah, I would agree. I would I would definitely start slow at first and, and see if if what you have is meeting the company's needs, and then if it isn't, then then continue to grow. Yeah, and I, I would add uh, that it's important to get feedback as the function grows, um, because you don't want to end up in a situation where you know one part of the company thinks that the regulatory intelligence department isn't providing value. Uh, so as, as you grow, you want to use that feedback to make sure that, uh, that you're providing increasing value to the rest of the company. Okay. Uh, at, sorry, because at some point you will be asked to demonstrate the return on investment of, uh, of regulatory intelligence. And this is some, something which is, uh, again, brought by professionals quite often and um, I don't, maybe you can, when you, sorry, when you set up your AI department or your AI initiative, uh, or do you start to think about um, the, the, the KPIs, uh, you, will, um, you, you will use to identify your performance after a while, and then go back to it and, and test how you perform, how your activities are doing and what you need to change uh, if necessary. Okay. Another question, how can we validate an RI tool as many information as open sources? Yeah. Uh, I think that validation comes from comparing what that tool is providing with other sources to see if it matches up. Um, but yeah, I mean, if you are looking at a open source free tool, sometimes it's difficult to tell whether the information it's providing is accurate. Um, but um, yeah, comparison is probably your best bet. Mm. Okay. Again, do a pros and cons and, uh, and map, match it with your, your needs and your colleagues' needs, uh, the strategy of your organization. And uh, yeah. 
it raises an interesting question though, because uh, often uh, when you're getting into the real depths of regulatory intelligence, you find information that comes from a single source and it may be difficult to validate that. So you, you have to apply some judgment um, and, and decide, you know, what are the risks of, of reacting to information that may not be accurate. And this is also the importance of networking. Uh, again, not everything is written in the books or in the guidelines. And um, part of the intelligence you will gather will come from the people you talk to, uh, whether in the, in the industry, regulators, um, or other organizations. Um, this is really important for you to, to speak to these people to get a real understanding of what you need to do and how you need to do it. Another question from participants, what all sorts of parameters are covered in regulatory intelligence? In the book or? It says in the regulatory intelligence, I'm thinking in the book. Yeah, I think the, the chapter list probably is the best. Right. Again, knowledge. if you go on our website, there is a table of contents and a sample chapter. Um, I think the table of contents, it can show the, the range of topics that we cover um, in the book. Um, I'd like to open it up to, I'd like to ask the same question to, to all three of you and you can answer individually. Um, from your experience working on the book, working on the chapters, um, what what would be your key takeaway, your aha, your wow, this is really important. Wow, regulatory affairs professionals need need to know this. Um, Bill, can I start with you? Sure. I, I guess my big takeaway is that everyone can be a regulatory intelligence person. Um, we all do it to some extent, um, and it's important for our jobs. Yeah, I, I would agree with Bill. I mean, that 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 is a, a big thing that that I, I took away from this project was the the importance of this type of information for everyone who works in regulatory or even folks who work in drug development in general. Um, and another aha moment as I was looking through the, the various chapters as they were coming in was, I mean, personally, I've I've really only worked at larger companies that have the resources to get access to the the paid resources like Cortellus and. Uh, and Tories and things like that. So looking through the, the chapter 10 public sources of regulatory precedent, I was very impressed with um, the amount of free information that's out there that is you know, just as good as something you'd find in Cortellus or, or, the, or the other uh, paid resources, um, but is available free, but you wouldn't come across unless you um, uh, know it yourself. Okay. On my side, I would say don't work in isolation. Uh, because regulatory intelligence is key to ensure the success of your organization and uh, it will help you and again your organization to build a robust uh, and coherent strategy uh, to save time, money and uh, being compliant. So uh, invest in regulatory intelligence. <laughs> okay. um, I just wanted to reiterate, so th the book is available for purchase. It has been substantially updated every chapter. Um, we have six brand new chapters. So if you have that second edition, um, this version is substantially different. Um, you can see a sample chapter on the website in the table of contents. It's available in print and electronic. Um, if you didn't hear me earlier, um, I'm, I'm the RAP staff member responsible for the production of books. If you, if you have a book topic, if you're interested in volunteering to, to work on our chapters and our books, contact me. I, I, will, I put my email in the chat. We actually have a couple more questions. I'm so excited. Um, what would you say are the key KPIs when you measure RI success in one organization? There's actually a chapter on that, chapter 21 by uh, Linda Bowen is, uh, is on regulatory intelligence metrics, how to measure success. So the book, uh, the book has quite a bit of discussion on that. 
Okay. And it's just not uh, time to answer <laughs> all timeliness of applications. It goes beyond that. We have one more question. Can you talk about, and does the book cover the value of attending conferences, especially for rapidly developing topics where it is difficult for regulators to keep pace and produce guidance? We, we, we do touch on that uh, topic in um, the professional association chapter, because oftentimes the best types of conferences, the best conferences that have this type of information uh, are um, by professional associations. Um, so yeah, that, that, that topic is covered in the book. Yeah, and, and you, you find information at conferences that you don't get anywhere else and is not otherwise available. Uh, it could be from uh, you know, networking with colleagues. It could be from seeing someone make an oral presentation and say things that aren't recorded elsewhere. Um, if you go to the posters, you might find poster content that's relevant. So uh, conferences can be very valuable as far as collecting regulatory intelligence, but it can also be very time consuming because uh, the only way you can collect that is to participate in the conference and, and, and it just takes a lot of commitment. Yeah. Oh, conferences and, and professional associations as well. Uh, volunteer, I would really encourage you to, uh, to volunteer either to Topra, RAPS, of course, and maybe other professional associations, because this is where you will be able to share with your peers and, again, to gather some information, uh, what's happening uh, in the different topics, what, you know, what can we expect from regulators or what are the, uh, the trends in discussions. Uh, again, really important. Yeah. Yeah, and, and the other piece I was going to mention is uh, um, regulators sometimes use these conferences as a way to announce new initiatives, new pilots, new projects. So sometimes uh, the, the first time you were, you were able to hear about, you know, this news is at the conference. We have another question. From where to start to map the RI roles and responsibilities in just starting RI department? Talk to HR. <laughs> uh, if this mapping is internally, um, so talk to your HR department or to your manager, depending on your reporting line. And um, potentially, there could be skills within your organizations uh, able to support the RI function, whether in the regulatory affairs department, whether in R&D, uh, marketing, why not? And um, again, talk to colleagues, peers in other organizations to understand how they've um, done their mapping. And there are some other tips in the, in the chapter five. Okay. Anything else? Well, we're, we're nearing the end. Um, does the panel want any final, final recommendations, final thoughts for the participants? Just yes, to put interest in the regulatory intelligence, and um, this is a, a fascinating topic. And uh, for years, it has been an area considered as a cost by many companies. Uh, now, they, I think most of them have understood the value of regulatory intelligence. Build on that. <laughs> Continue to uh, to raise your voice uh, within your organization and outside of your organization. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Selena. And, and I would agree with Selena. I think. Uh, RI is growing in importance within companies and within regulatory groups. So I can only continue to see that grow, uh, to, to can grow in as a trend. And I would say uh, to all the participants, go out there and do good things. And uh, we're all happy to serve as a resource. So if you find any unusual problems or have questions, don't hesitate to email us uh, directly and we'll try to help out. Yeah. Okay. We have no final questions from the audience. So I think we are good. I appreciate everyone's time. Again, go on the website, check out that table of contents, check out the, um, the sample chapter. Um, it's, it's a good collection of topics. Um, thank you, Bill, Danish, and Celine for your time today and for your participation on the book.
If anyone wants to get involved with RAPS, send me an email, ghaltraps.org, and I can talk you uh, talk to you about the book's production process and how you can get involved. So thanks, everybody. I appreciate it. It's a good session. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everybody.